Imagine being born into a life where you have no hope of achieving your dreams because of the limitations imposed on you. This was the reality of Henry McNeil Turner. But Henry McNeil Turner was not one to allow his environment to bring him down. At the time Henry McNeil Turner was born, the laws in South Carolina, where he was born prohibited Africans from learning how to read and write. Even though by virtue of his birth, he was a freed African, Turner was under this law as well. However, when he was apprenticed to work in cotton fields with captured Africans, he ran away to Abbeville, where he found a job as a custodian for a law firm. In time, Henry McNeil Turner would become a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME, and a fierce speaker for the rights of the black men. His words and actions served to a huge degree in convincing the black people to fight for their rights during the Civil War and after, sparking the fire that would light the way to freedom. Body Henry McNeil Turner was born as a free African on February 1, 1834 in Newberry, South Carolina, to parents of mixed African-European ancestry. Turner's paternal grandparents were a white woman planter and an African man. Due to this, According to the laws of the land, the white woman's mixed-race children were born free because she was white and free. His maternal grandfather is said to have been enslaved in Africa and transported to South Carolina, where he was renamed David Greer. There, the slave traders noticed that he had royal Mandingo tribal marks and subsequently freed him. Henry Turner grew up with his mother Sarah, Greer Turner, and his maternal grandmother. At age 14, Turner became inspired during a Methodist revival and swore to become a pastor. At age 19, he received his preacher's license from the Methodist Church South in 1853. The church had split into Northern and Southern units in 1844 over slavery and other issues. And for a few years, he began to travel throughout the South as an evangelist. In 1858, Turner moved his family to St. Louis, Missouri out of fear that members of his family would be kidnapped and sold into slavery, an act that had happened to hundreds of other free blacks. The Fugitive Slave Law enacted in 1850 had increased the incentives for capturing refugee slaves and offered little protection for the free slaves who had been illegally captured, leading to hundreds of such wrongful arrests. In Street Lewis, Turner studied the classics, Hebrew and divinity at Trinity College. He became ordained as a minister in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME, which was founded in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as the first independent black denomination in the United Nations. From there, he served in various pastorates in Baltimore, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., where he met influential Republicans in the early 1860s. At the time the Civil War began, Turner was training in Baltimore, in April 1862, he was assigned to the Israel Bethel Church on Capitol Hill, the largest church in Washington, D.C., near the heart of the government and the war in Virginia. At the church, congressmen and army officers visited to hear Turner preach. It was during the Civil War that Turner began what would become a lifetime of advocacy. He organized one of the first black troops regiments and was appointed as its chaplain. He urged the blacks to enlist, preaching to them while they trained that the destiny of their race depended on their loyalty and courage. The regiment often went to his church to hear his patriotic speeches. By July 1863, the regiment completed its formation and was preparing to leave for war. In November of the same year, Henry McNeil Turner was commissioned as chaplain, becoming the only black officer in the first United States colored troops. Turner would be a chaplain here for two years. He caught smallpox and spent months in the hospital recovering, and in 1864, he returned to his company just before they participated in the Battle of Wilson's Wharf. From May to December, his unit participated in the fighting around Petersburg and Richmond, Virginia. He spent the spring of 1865 with his men while they joined Sherman's march through North Carolina. When the fighting stopped, he was sent to the Roanoke Island to supervise a settlement of freed slaves. After being discharged in September, Turner was recommissioned as chaplain of another African-American regiment. Soon after he arrived there, however, 
he resigned and left the army. Turner turned his attention to politics, civil rights, and black nationalism. He became a politician during the Reconstruction era, being elected to state government. While he was serving in the army, he had refined his thinking about the African race and its future in America. He was with the Republican Party, whose officials under Abraham Lincoln had emancipated the slaves throughout the Confederacy. In 1868, he was elected to the Georgia legislature. Even though the Democrats refused to seat Turner and 26 other black legislators at first, the federal government intervened and Turner and his fellow legislators were allowed to take their seat. In the late 19th century, Turner witnessed the state legislatures in the South passing measures in the South to disenfranchise blacks. He became a proponent of black nationalism and advocated for the return of American blacks to Africa. He thought it was the one way they could be free and independent. Turner founded the International Migration Society, which he funded with his own newspapers, the Voice of Missions, and later the Voice of the People. He organized two ships containing a total of 500 or more emigrants who traveled to Liberia in 1895 and 1896. But the American blacks assumed air of superiority to the native Africans in the area and established their own society, with some of them eventually returning to the United States. After that, he never organized another expedition. During and after the 1880s, Turner supported prohibition and women's suffrage movements. He was chancellor for 12 years of Morris Brown College, a historically black college affiliated with the AME Church in Georgia. In the 1890s, Turner sailed four times to Liberia and Sierra Leone, organizing four annual AME conferences in Africa to introduce more American blacks to the continent. He also worked to establish the AME Church in South Africa, which he merged with the Ethiopian Church. With his efforts, Turner paved a way for black African students from South Africa to go to the United States and attend Wilberforce University in Ohio, a historically black college owned and operated by the AME Church since 1863. Henry McNeil Turner was famed for his fiery oratory skills. One of his most notable speeches was at the first Black Baptist Convention in 1898, where he preached that God was black. He argued against the racist view that the only correct image of God was as a fine-looking, symmetrical, and ornamented white man, arguing that every race of man have described their God as symbolized in them. So why should the Negro not believe that he resembles God? On May 8, 1915, Henry McNeil Turner died at the age of 81, having served as a minister, politician, and the 12th elected bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. He had spent his life advocating for the civil rights of the blacks. Turner was married four times and had 14 children with his first wife, Eliza Preacher, four of whom reached the age of adulthood. The Turner Chapel in Oakville, Ontario was built in 1890 by escaped slaves and named in his honor, and a portrait of him hangs in the Georgia State Capitol. Turner's life is an example of what happens when we do not allow circumstances to define us. He left a legacy that will continue to last for generations, as a testament to his courage. If you were captivated by this story and you want to know more about the lives of such extraordinary people, don't forget to like this video. Subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to keep updated with our latest content. Your support means the world to us. Thank you for watching and stay with us as we continue to unravel the extraordinary tapestry of human achievement, one story at a time.